Welcome to Tech Inspection, where we talk about all things drag racing. I'm Brian Petty, also joined by Brian Wagner, editor of Dragzine. And today we're talking about Nitro Systems and their components with Nitro Dave and Jamie Wagner. Brian, how are you doing, man? Doing good, man. Doing good. How about yourself? Uh, not too bad. I'm, I'm really excited about this episode because uh, you and I both have uh, nitrous cars that we I, mine's currently apart, but I don't know about yours, but it's going to be interesting to talk about uh, nitrous and get these guys feedback on, on the systems for sure. Yeah, I actually, you know, full disclosure, I use one of uh, nitrous outlet, one of Dave's systems, and I've always had really, really good luck with it. And more than that, I've always had really good luck talking with Dave and learning about nitrous in general. And, you know, he's a really, really good asset just with everything that happens, you know, with plate system, because my car uses a plate system. So I'm looking forward to kind of hearing more about what he has to say about how to maximize these systems and everything. And to answer your question currently, my engine is sitting in fully disassembled form. So, so we're in the same boat. That's good to know. <laughs> with everything going on, it's like, well, I can't really race. I mean, luckily races are starting to, you know, uh, pile up so we can uh, start getting our cars together. Maybe it'll give us some motivation. But uh, so before we dive in with the guests, I am going to send you this video for uh, the fun segment this week. I just stumbled across it on Facebook, and every time I watch it, it is hilarious. I love it. It, it cracks me up. It's, it, it's cringeworthy for sure, but I think it's just hilarious. So if you want to go ahead and pull it up and watch it, it's, it's great. Uh, I've got it up right now. I like the, uh, the dipping. You know, pre-lubrication is key. And, uh, oh, a wild sledgehammer appears. And, like, diesel oil. <laughs> yeah, that... Uh... They start off with diesel oil, and then... Because anybody that's put a cam in, like, sometimes they could be a little bit of a thing to line up, and then he just jams it in. Yeah, I, I don't think Comp Cams is going to warranty that for some reason, you know. And if you've ever, Probably, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, the, the uh, fact that the cam, you know, at least we know now what the, the, the failure point is on a cam is you hit it with a sledgehammer, it will break. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> never knew that. Learn, learn something new today. No, I mean, yeah, who would have thought that really, really extremely hardened uh, steel would uh, be brittle? That's a new fact. But, yeah, I thought that was really funny. I just wanted to to show everybody that, but I love it because it starts off with a di dipping in ridiculously disgusting oil, and then it's like getting frustrated. Let's just break it off. So yeah, I, just, I just love how that the, is no my... warning, just sledgehammer. <laughs> Out of nowhere. Well, let's just get this thing in there. So, all right, so n n that, that does it for the fun segment uh, this week. Uh, funny, cringeworthy video. And now let's go ahead and have our, I think our first guest, uh, I think Nitro Dave, yeah, I think he's on the line. Nitro Dave, how's it going, man? Hey, I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? <laughs> doing, doing well, doing well. Okay. So obviously we're talking about nitrous today and uh, uh, first off, we really appreciate you coming on the show. And I'll just open up with one really broad uh, question what in your mind are some of the pros and cons of like a plate nitro system versus a fogger nitro system well over the last year that's changed quite a bit uh, whenever we entered the market into uh, the racing platforms there the nitrous plate designs were pretty lacking so there was a huge advantage to running a direct port over a, a plate and so a lot of the classes would give weight breaks uh, for running a plate, and they would they would let you have a little bit more uh, power or, or jet, if you want to call it, uh, over a direct port. So there was a huge advantage to it. Over the last year, uh, because of how much the plate designs have advanced, that uh, the... Uh, I'm going to say the, the, the gain or the positive to, to run in a plate has kind of been knocked way down now. <clears throat> so whenever somebody comes to us, uh, they generally come to us at, you know, saying, here's the class I'm racing and here's the rules. Uh, what's going to be my best option. I take and look at those rules and dissect them and try to find a, an advantage. Uh, whether it's a direct port or a plate or a way to get the plate to perform uh, more to the jet restriction that's there. Uh, and each class is different, but a lot of the rules are starting to get real close together. I mean, a lot of people are following John Sears' rules now. And so uh, 
I guess what I'm trying to say is is the pros and cons have have changed a lot over the last year. Right on. G- kind of going off of that, Dave, with you know all these different products are available out there. One of plate systems, you know, why is a plate system such a good product for someone that likes to use like like you know with my car like a street strip car? Why is that plate system such a good fit for it? Well, in the EFI world, uh, the EFI world is going to be a little bit different than than your you know, your 4150, 4500 style flange uh, EFI and carbureted application. You know, a car like yours where it's a late model GM for the people that don't know what you have, uh, the LS platform and late model Hemi and late model Ford EFI, all those EFI applications. I mean, we're, we got an EFI plate that, that distributes nitrous across the intake track. And what it does is it saturates the intake charge uh, of the incoming airflow and and when we atomize into that airstream, we just allow the motor to pull the, the discharge in. So that plate's going to work a little bit different than your 4150 and 4500 that's coming into the top of the center of the intake. So I had a question about basically like what kind of power levels you guys like to go with plate versus uh, like a fogger system. and. It's kind of a follow-up to what you were talking about before, how plate systems have come a long way. Maybe talk about the technology and then what kind of systems you like to, or what, like what kind of chassis and cars you'd like to see foggers on and what kind of setups do you like to see like a plate on? Yeah, so, you know, back in the uh, 93 to 97 LT1 days, uh, I like to use that for, for, uh, for a discussion because that's really about the time where my knowledge and nitrous started really gaining and I started looking at product designs uh we owned a speed shop back then and and uh I spent a lot of time just tuning nitrous systems and and I was always finding that I was having to tune around design flaws or characteristics of of delivery from the design and back then the the theory you know everything was a single nozzle that went in the induction tube uh or uh, there was a company called TNT Nitrous that had a, a 3 8 plate that bolted behind the, the throttle body and it had two nozzles which aimed at the back of the intake plenum. And the problem with that was is that the discharge was so close to the front runners that it didn't give the atomization time to mitts into the airstream to, to distribute into those front runners. So on a small horsepower application, it didn't show, but as you started really pushing nitrous into that application, it was overpowering the back cylinders and it eventually hurt the motor. So back then we started really preaching reading spark plugs, but even if you were reading spark plugs, you wouldn't know because it wasn't getting any nitrous or fuel. Um, that's really where nitrous outlets curve of plate knowledge started. What we determined is we had to saturate the air intake charge and give the nitrous time to mix in uh, to the airstream before it even before the air incoming airflow ever made it to the front runners, um, and because the LT1 platform back then the front runners were so much closer than any other intake design, we actually did something that we kept quiet for a long time, and what we did is we actually discharged the nitrous against the air coming airflow, so we put six discharges across the the butterfly holes. Uh, and we still put a plate in between the throttle and the, and the intake, but we were actually discharging against the airflow. And what that did is if you could vision it in your head, the nitrous was coming against it and then the airflow would overpower it and it would curve it back around. And in that process, it saturated the air intake charge and it allowed us to start putting more nitrous through the application. That's uh, really so- interesting. Yeah, and so then your LS platform came out, and, and I know I'm using GM a lot, but, but that's really kind of where uh, my interest was, was the GM platform, and then it grew into other stuff as we went. But, you know, the GM, uh, the LS platform came out, and, and that was the second nitrous plate. So before that point, no one made a billet nitrous plate. And before that point, also, nitrous outlet was just building accessories to work with other manufacturers' products. So we really concentrated on accessories and, and items to make their product work better uh, that they didn't offer. And so uh, the LS platform came out and uh, 
we took that same technology except for because the front runners were further back away from the throttle body flange we didn't have to go against the incoming airflow but what was really funny about that is when we were designing all these plates uh, the we didn't the technology we had uh, was very limited so like i went down to a buddy of mine that owns a company called landscape supply and i borrowed two big uh leaf blowers and i built a uh adapter that would go to the the front of the plate area to create my income and airflow uh, because i mean back then uh, ls was about 700 cfm if i remember correctly coming into the throttle body on a stock application i had no equipment or money or anything like that to, to generate real world results but i could generate airflow through the plate so i use the leaf blowers to figure out how to saturate the air intake charge and that's that's when we started dominating late model efi because then we had adapted that technology over into late model ford and then hemi and we started working these niche markets and and i didn't realize that was really setting us up for the future of the racing industry at the time because i was i was i was learning as i was going but i was picking these platforms and I would go out and tune these cars for free. I would just fly out and um, a great example is uh, Dan Van Horn owns a, uh, a, a race series called uh, late, late Model Hemi. And uh, he would put on those races and he would fly me to all these races to work with AJ Birch and AJ would do the computer side and I would do all the nitro side. And it was a late model Hemi platform was so technical limited you know, you got an overdrive, independent rear suspension, four door charger that weighs like 5,000 pounds. And we're, we were putting, you know, 400 horsepower through it back then. And I remember when we stepped to a 600 horsepower, by that time we had, I'm sorry, I'm getting off track, but we started off with the plate and then we went to a direct port. Uh, but the thing was, is as we started learning all these, these platforms, uh, we started learning a lot more about air delivery and how the motor is more of a, just an air pump and the flow character, character characteristics and when things start suffering. And a good example is, is so we first introduced a better way of saturating air and take charge. But then a great example I like to use is uh, the fast intake for the LSs. They offered a 90 and a 92 millimeter and I could push up to about 250 horsepower, 300 horsepower through an EFI plate before the cylinder to cylinder distribution would start to suffer. And we would know that from reading the plugs. Well, whenever they came out with a the fast 102, it the airflow delivery was different. And on the same motor, I was at Sunshine Performance and we were tuning on his motor and it had a 92 millimeter intake and throttle on it. All we did was change, it was a LS427, and all we did was change the intake manifold to a 102. And we started, before we were seeing that cylinder to cylinder distribution change at 300, and by just simply changing the airflow uh, delivery from changing the intake design, it started suffering at 250, uh, 250 horsepower. So then, you know, that's whenever we went to a direct port. Uh, later on, that same technology always said I would never design a carbureted plate unless I could design something that worked properly um, and all that that earlier testing and R&D and just learning really taught me that none of these intakes deliver airflow exactly the same so whenever you got over into the 4150 and 4500 flange carbureted stuff and, e and EFI stuff that that same theory carried over it was just worse and the industry was was fed that a one size fits all theory for so long and uh, they were fed that all these plates have uh, distribution issues which they did you know when they take it work great and then that's when it wouldn't uh, we designed the nitrous puck which uh, we designed that before any 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 carb or EFI 4150 4500 style plate and what that was is it looks like a hockey puck and it mounts in the floor of a 4150 4500 intake manifold and it discharges directly down each intake runner 
it's basically a direct port, but you can't control volume. It's still a single jet. Uh, in the sense of how a direct port d distributes evens amounts of nitrous to each runner, it does that. But you can't manipulate the volume into each runner like you can a direct port. Um, so the uh, we made that puck, and then people started asking us about, uh, hey, can we use this in ultra, which is a class uh, in radial racing, small tire radial racing. And to be honest with you, at the time, I didn't even know what ultra was. Uh, so that became a door open for us because I reached out to John Sears and he said, hey, if you could take that technology and put it in a nitrous plate, we'd welcome it. And so that put me into a whole new perspective. Uh, and uh, I started thinking about, but I think what really pushed me is there was a chat forum that uh, was pretty big in the carburetor world. And, and the moderator, the nitro section was kind of a bulldog and he started pushing me around and it just fueled me to design a carbureted plate to go after that market. Uh, so we came out with a stinger series and the stinger basically took the puck and it just in the EFI plates that we were making and it contribute and it took that same technology and it, it adapted it all into one and and the stinger plate uh, would discharge in a 360 degree radius in the center of the the intake throat on the 4150 4500 and it saturate the air intake charge and let the motor do its natural job and pull the discharge in so that was really that plate uh, the first one was a Stinger 1, and I think, if I remember correctly, it matched out at 450 horsepower. Single entry. No, it was 500 horsepower. Single entry. Well, up to that point, nobody in these race series were even putting that much nitrous through a, through a, a carburetor plate. Uh, and the only competition I had, the ones that were pushing it, uh, pushing that much nitrous, they kept hurting the motor because the... Think about like this, where a lot of people don't realize this, but that air flows coming into your motor, right? And you pedal the car, what happens? It, it's always dangerous to pedal a, a nitrous car. <laughs> right, but, so we're talking about incoming airflow. Well, if you pedal the car, it changes the intake pulses of airflow. So they would have their motor tuned. Back then, whenever the Stinger series first entered the market, the, the crossbar plate uh, was actually very popular. And uh, it was just a, a, dual, a, a spray bar plate that uh, was shaped like a cross, one went one side and one went the other. And, and it, had it, it had its day where that was the plate to run. And uh, what people didn't realize is they were, they were reading their plugs and they were properly tuning their motor. But that was for perfect airflow delivery. And whenever you pedal a car, there is no perfect airflow delivery. Everything changes. And so they would start killing r random cylinders and nobody could understand why they were hurting cylinders whenever just last pass the plugs looked great. And so the Stinger plate series really addressed that. Uh, but that crossbar plate was a dual entry plate and everybody was wanting the Stinger plate to flow as much as the crossbar plate. And uh, so I had to go back to the drawing board and we realized how to get the Stinger to flow more and that's where the stinger 2 came out and all we did was open up the passageway and uh change uh how the nitrous entered the stinger cone and all of a sudden we had a sit turn 40 horsepower plate and that really changed uh the market so then and i, I know i'm i'm going on but i'm going to give you the history here so then we can get over into the direct ports uh so then we came to realize I'm going to tell you since day one, the small block forward has been like my nemesis uh, with plate design. It is such a temperamental platform. Uh, the four corners run hot already, just NA. And uh, it is a very hard application to make happy with a nitrous plate. And uh, the uh, C, not CID, uh, before. It was CID's first company. Uh, oh man, my mind just went blank. But anyway, CID uh, 
John used to own another company, and, and I can't remember what it was called. But uh, that intake, CHI, uh, the CHI intake uh, 4.0 was very popular in the small block Ford. And uh, the really taller applications with the Stinger, now we're at the point where we're putting so much nitrous into that plenum, that design with that tall, whenever you start increasing the distance from the top of the intake runner to the where the plate or the throttle body bolts, and you start putting so much nitrous just spraying across it, you start killing the incoming airflow. It's just like a wall cutting off the airflow, and it, and it would kill carburetor signal. And uh, I had a customer that uh, had a very fast application, and he was he was pretty smart at what he did. And he heard his motor, and he called me, and he's like, "Hey, man, I got a problem." Well, as we started looking at the intake, you could see where the nitrous was sandblasting the top of the intake because the incoming airflow just couldn't, and the, and the engine vacuum on a lot of nitrous goes away. So it just couldn't pull the discharge in. So we determined, well, we got to get that discharge lower in the plenum so that the motor can do its job and pull it in. So we came out with a Stinger 3. And by doing that, we also had to get the discharge right above the runner so that we could get even amounts into it. Well, on the all other applications, the Stinger 3 became like, so the, the Stinger 2 started setting records, and it became like, oh, the Stinger plate, right? And then all of a sudden the Stinger 3 comes out, and the focus goes over to the Stinger 3. Well, on the small block Ford, now we're introducing the same amount of nitrous into all eight cylinders instead of allowing the motor to pull the discharge in as it wanted, like the Stinger 2 did. And the small block Ford didn't like it. When you started putting a lot of nitrous into it, those four corners start getting hot. And uh, they didn't like it. And I'm going to tell you that I got really frustrated. So what we started doing for all the race guys was we would take the cone and we would change the orifice hole sizes in the corners. Uh, and it took a lot of work. We'd either plug it or or do whatever we had to do to, to, to alternate the the flow delivery so that those we weren't killing those four corners. It took two years to come out with a Stinger 4. And people were joking, asking how many Stinger plates it was going to take to get it right. And I think at the time, people just didn't really realize how different all these different engine platforms and airflow delivery is. And as you start putting that much nitrous into something and not controlling the delivery into it with a direct port, it starts getting a little bit more difficult on some of these platforms. And the Stinger 4 took two years because I bet I, I bet I made, this is no exaggeration, I probably made 60 prototypes over the time. And I would think I had something figured out and it didn't work right. And I get frustrated and then I would st set it aside and I would do a project for somebody that would spark a, a, a an idea. And last year, we finally perfected the stinger four and what the stinger four did is it goes back to the stinger two uh theory but it's up high but we're discharging in a downward angle and while that sounds like duh you know like why don't you think of that well we did the problem was is we had to get the nitrous and the fuel discharge flipped and uh in order to do that and get the all get the nitrous and the fuel to discharge correctly it took some it took a lot of trial and error so now we got a stinger two because we discontinued the stinger one so now we got stinger two stinger three and stinger four just to design properly discharged plates so now we get over into the uh plate versus direct port right well people started arguing well hey these plates work so great and all the records that were getting set, if you looked at them in all the classes, they were with a nitrous plate. And uh, with that being well, said, my competitor... Go ahead. I was going to say, co coming off of that, you know, kind of just some real quick tips. You know, what can a racer do to get the most out of their plate system? Really, it's going to come down to, uh, no matter what design it is, it's going to come down to cylinder to cylinder tuning. Uh, if it's carbureted ap application, it really needs a grid uh, so you can control timing per cylinder. Uh, 
if it's a EFI application, that's even better because now we can control fuel per cylinder and timing per cylinder. Uh, but what you still can't control is volume per cylinder. And that's where a plate should still have a benefit in these classes, in my opinion, because, uh, or should have some type of rule uh, perk for running a plate. Well, even though the plate designs have have advanced so much further than than uh, over the past years, there's still a design. There's still a uh, tuning aspect that requires a uh, a knowledge set that uh, not everyone has. Um, because as you start introducing large amounts of nitrous into these uh, cylinders. They, uh, if you have a cylinder that doesn't want that much volume, and this has nothing to do with air and fuel or timing, if it physically cannot take that much volume of nitrous, it starts beating the snot out of that, that cylinder, and it, and it kills these motors. And, and for the racers, I work with a lot of different racers, and, and I'm going to tell you, some of these guys go back and they disassemble these motors, and, and they read the parts. And what that means is they take that engine apart and they inspect every aspect of it and they start seeing the abuse that certain parts of that motor is taking. And a lot of times in these nitrous applications, the reason why those applications are taken out of use is because it's getting too much volume to that cylinder. Um, so Dave, I, I hate to cut you off, but we are out of time. There's very few people <laughs> that know and have as much experience as you do. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, if there's just, you know, one more thing that you could, uh, I guess, give as parting knowledge, uh, and advice, just a couple, like one, one simple thing that you see a lot of guys make a mistake on and, and it's easily preventable. What would that be? Timing. Timing is the biggest, uh, engine killer for a nitrous motor o over timing it. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and, and that is something that definitely comes up a lot is timing and, and putting too much in with, with nitrous for sure. So Dave, we want to have you back on for sure. There's so much knowledge and this is such a deep topic that we can really dive into. Um, but again, thank you so much for being on the show. We really appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Man, Wagner, that is so much knowledge and like there's so many topics we can talk about. I want to know your favorite thing. My favorite thing was when he was talking about the leaf blowers and like trying to uh, simulate, you know, air flowing and, and trying to get something going there. That was my favorite part. I don't know what yours was, but I, I loved when he dove right into that. Well, I think just Dave's depth of knowledge on nitrous is really, really amazing. Just, you know, learning about the, like you said, the distribution, how important it is. That's something that really people need to keep in mind with these plate systems for sure. Absolutely. So that was that was a real treat. I, you know, hopefully we can have him back on again for a future episode. But now we have Jamie on the phone. We've got him on the line. Hey, Jamie, what's going on, man? I appreciate you guys uh, asking me to, to be on for what limited knowledge I have. I'll be glad to share with you. Yeah, you got you got more than I think Wagner and I combined. So I think we'll be just fine. So uh, I just want to pitch you a question about uh, play technology. Uh, okay. with nitro systems since that's what we're talking about today and maybe how they've changed over the years and you can even dive into how nitrous has progressed and how you see it progressing in the future with plate or you know even fogger systems as well okay yeah well you know i'd have to say that as far as nitrous as an industry or as it's used in motorsports hasn't really evolved a massive amount over the last I don't know, even probably 30 years since uh, I think they started back in the 80s is whenever uh, uh, the original NOS guys kind of got started in this. And if you look back at some of the designs that they had and, and dig up an old catalog or something they had and you look at what's available right now, other than some, you know, uh, bold new graphics and things like that, it's really kind of very similar to what it was then. Uh, I think the way the, the biggest change in it is, is we've kind of went about the way we tune things and the knowledge that we've gained over all these years and and uh, what we've learned works good and what doesn't work good has changed a lot. And then obviously with electronic fuel injection has made a huge leap forward uh, for nitrous control. 
because you have more ability to to get your distribution issues and trim cylinders and and manage the power a whole lot better. Uh, the plate technology itself, again, if you look at, at some of those old catalogs and look at what we have now, like the, the cheater plates, which are probably our most popular kit at Holly, uh, is really the same design as it was then. We've, we've changed the tubes out to some stainless steel tubes instead of the old uh, copper bronze tubes. Uh, we've made a EDM machines to make the holes, which are a, a lot more consistent and accurate. Uh, but, you know, some machine uh, operations to make the plates a little nicer and and things like that. But it, the, the core of it still is basically the same. The solenoids that we used back then are still very similar. The plates that we use, the, the tubes that we use are all still very similar. So as, as you can look at it, one of two things either. One way is it just hasn't changed a whole lot uh, due to there's been very little uh, effort put into making it better, or you have to look at it as what they had then was pretty darn good, and it just doesn't need a lot of changing uh, to still be very effective for what you have today. Now, looking at these plate applications, Jamie, you, you can see them used in everything from heads-up racing to bracket racing, you know, guys trying to use, you know, the jug to try to catch up sometimes. What makes these plate systems such a good overall fit and function, you know, technologically, you know, how, how do they work so well with all these different applications? Well, I think a lot of it is just the, the one thing that's very attractive about the plate system is the, I would have to say the relative simplicity of it. Uh, you don't have to do a lot of fabrication work. You don't have to take the manifold off and, and put bungs in it to put screw in nozzles in things like that. It's you take the thing out of the package, you assemble the parts, you lift up the carburetor or the throttle body, whatever you may have, you put this thing underneath it or between it and the manifold and hook up the lines, put a jet in it and off you go. So the simplicity of it, I think is, is probably the, the biggest thing uh, makes it easy to put on. If you don't want it, you can take it back off again and, and nobody's the wiser of it. Uh, you don't need a lot of space around things. So your air cleaners don't get crashing in the parts Your fuel rails. If it's a fuel injection system, don't crash in the parts. Uh, I think your initial investment is, is lower with a plate system just purely because there's fewer components in it. It's all pretty well bolt on. So I think that's the reason that you see a lot of plate systems is it's just purely the simplicity and and relative ease of putting it together and making it, uh, you could put a plate system on in an afternoon if you wanted to. And uh, I think that's what's really attractive about them. So I, I kind of want to follow up with another question, uh, kind of along the same lines of technology. How do you see nitrous progressing uh, in the future and where do you think it needs to progress in the future because right now i mean you look at pro mod nitrous cars versus pro mod boost cars whether it's supercharged or turbo like they're all super fast like when radio versus the world you know or limited drag radio or xc75 like all of the nitrous supercharger turbo records are like right there and you touched on it with you know other technology advancing and we've talked about that on the show multiple times just how everything in the industry is like advancing but then you kind of talk about how a lot of nitro stuff hasn't advanced how do you think it needs to advance well i think the the control of the whole system and when i say that i mean the electronic control of it so the nozzles the solenoids all those types of things uh, they're still pretty i hate to say crude but they're still very basic in the way they operate. So, you know, if, if the nitrous world is going to progress and and become a, a force like what the, the turbo systems have come in the last bunch of years, uh, somebody's going to have to sit down and put the time and effort into learning how to control what we have better or ideally uh, developing a new nozzle uh, solenoid combination that will give you a much finer control, more of a, a closed loop feedback type system, something like that. Because the things with nitrous that you really, that's, that's really the challenge is the systems are always, uh, you have to get, you know, keep up with the control systems on them. That being the solenoids and, and the nozzles. Uh, the bottle pressures become an issue because as you use the nitrous more, the bottle pressure drops as, as the bottle heats up or cools down, the pressure changes, which has a, pretty dramatic effect on the tune-up of your nitrous system. 
So there's some things with control systems, uh, bottle pressure issues that would need to be worked out. And, and just the overall, it just needs a revamp on, on everything. The turbo systems have come along uh, from what they were a bunch of years ago. And it's a lot of us due to the control systems, you know, very good electronic wastegate controls, uh, very good fuel management controls, very good uh, uh, spark and just general engine management stuff. But the basics of the, the turbo don't rely heavily. It, it's as much a design of the turbo itself that has really pulled um, that, that technology forward. And that's the same thing would need to be done to some extent with the nitrous systems. Uh, we need to come up with something better. And I think we're, we pretty much got the limits of everything that we currently have. And now we're just stacking systems on top of other systems. So if you look at the pro mods, um, whenever I started this, three systems was, was a big deal. Uh, if we could get three systems to run a quarter of a mile, that was, that was doing something. Uh, now they're, uh, the last time I, I was dealing with some of the pro mod guys, uh, we were running six systems pretty easily. And I know some people have run even more than that testing. I don't know if, Currently, if there's a lot of stuff out there, more than five or six systems running, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are. Obviously, nitrous combinations are generally really big cubic inch. We talk about the big boys. I mean, a, you know, a 748 Fulton used to be the deal, and then it was a 909 and a 959, and now we got like a standard of a 1,001 or 1,002 cubic inches. Are we eventually going to run out of cubic inches of displacement for these combinations? Well, I think at some point, just the, the physics of slinging that much material around comes into a real problem. Um, so, you know, back when, when the 903s came out, I was working with some of the guys on that, and there was a real issue initially with the things wanting to throw the rods out of them uh, and until they got a handle on, on getting some of that rotating mass squared away. That was a, a real issue, and I don't know how they're dealing with some of this 1,000 cubic inch stuff now. Because if you look at the, the RPMs of those things, when they go across the finish line, they're – they're going, it's hard to believe that those piston speeds and that much mass can, can move. So Yeah, because they're, they're changing everything from bore spacing to rod ratio to deck height to everything, and it's still not great geometry, right? Right, yeah. you got to just think about how much, <laughs> how much weight just in a piston on its own that the thing is, is having to, to change directions on overlap or something like that, and why it doesn't pull things stronger. And Obviously, the metallurgy has, has gotten better. But I, I think at some point, yes, there, there's going to be a breaking point of where you get the, the cubic inch enough uh, that you, you just can't put any more into it reliably. Uh, and then at that point, it's about trying to do nitrous better. And can you get more nitrous in it? Because there is, there, there is a, a, a ratio here that, that we have to deal with of the amount of nitrous that can displace the amount of ambient air and the things to function properly. So if you can get to the point where you have too much nitrous going into the engine and it's displacing all the air and it just doesn't burn efficiently, it doesn't separate the molecules, all that kind of stuff. And so when you get to that, that point, so now the amount of, of nitrous that you can get into the cylinder, it reaches its limit, the cylinder size reaches its limit, well, then you got nowhere else to go. You know, then you have to find something else that becomes a weight issue. Uh, you know, trying to find some other ways to make them competitive other than power. Lately in like the top dog stuff, when you talk about pro modified radio cars, that kind of stuff, nitrous systems and their, the engines underneath or connected to the nitrous system just keep getting bigger. I mean, the 700 cubic inches used to be huge and now it's like small when you're talking about the big dogs, they go from 700 to 800 to 909, 959, and now we're over a thousand cubic inches on the big, big stuff. Are we going to run out of displacement? Because I feel like the geometry is getting really crazy in these big inch nitrous motors. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think that at some point you're going to get the diminishing returns on, on this size business. Uh, the amount of, of material and, and mass and rotational mass and reciprocating mass, all that kind of stuff that's being thrown around inside those big engines is, is just amazing that they, that they hold up. Uh, maybe one of the reasons that you see, you know, a lot of eighth mile racing is, is kind of dominated over the quarter mile stuff <clears throat> of what was several years ago. When we started out uh, with these big engines, uh, the, the 903 cubic inch and 905s, I think, were, were the, the big dog at, at the time uh, when I was involved in it a little more than I am now. And 
there was an issue with, you know, the things we're wanting to throw the rods out of them because of all the, the mass and, and rotational stuff that's going on inside those monsters. Uh, and now they've got them at, you know, thousand plus inches. And I, I, I don't know how they're keeping them together. Uh, you know, obviously they probably have to be bringing the RPM back just a little bit, something like that. Yeah. But you start getting to back to the nitrous relationship to it. You start getting to an issue of there's only so much nitrous that you can put into a cylinder as the ratio of nitrous versus the ambient air mixture. So the ambient air mixture has to, to light off with the, the fuel, the gasoline, whatever you're using for fuel uh, to build the heat to get the nitrous to start separating and, and pulling the, the oxygen apart in it. So that ratio is, is a finite amount. You can only have so much nitrous into the amount of ambient air that you're putting in. So once you reach that limit, it starts becoming very inefficient, and somewhat unpredictable. And so then you just have to start increasing the volume of the cylinder that you're putting that amount into so you can get the more volume uh, at the same ratios. And that's where the large cubic inch stuff is coming in at. And, you know, at some point, you know, it has to stop, I guess. Uh, the materials, metallurgy, things like that have gotten good enough to where they're, they're actually holding together for now. But I have to think there's a, a breaking point on it somewhere down the road pretty close. And then you start getting into once the cubic inch <clears throat> size gets limited, uh, you still only have a finite amount of nitrous that you can put into that cylinder. So you start getting to, to be competitive. It starts coming into weight breaks and other things that, you know, transmission ratios or transmission speeds if it's a six speed or a five speed or whatever it is and uh so that'll be the deal is to see what they're going to do with it and see if they'll try to you know adjust the rules to keep them competitive because honestly if, if it was just a straight up one to one uh and and they just let them have the same weights and the all that the turbo cars would outpace everything out there i believe Unfortunately, I have to agree with you on that. I, I'm building a nitrous car, and sometimes I ask myself, why? <laughs> why am I doing this? Like, we need, I feel like there needs to be advancements. I mean, cubic inch, you know, you brought it up and touched on it about the geometry just being bad. It's like, man, these things have the biggest bore spacing I've ever seen. The stroke and the rod ratio is just like astronomically terrible on paper. And they're spinning them, they're spinning them, you know, seven, eight, I don't even know how many thousand RPMs anymore. They probably don't even want to talk about it or think about it because it's just disgusting. <laughs> but I mean, they're staying competitive. They're staying competitive and... I've done, I've worked with Pat Musi for years. Uh... And, and Ricky Smith and Shannon Jenkins and those guys. And, and personally, my, my own personal majority of experience in, in doing my stuff is I do land speed racing uh, on motorcycles and then I do tuning for people that do land speed racing. So to give you an idea on nitrous stuff to, to, to what, what you can do with it. We have a, uh, one of the guys I've helped out for years has a, uh, a fourth gen Pontiac Firebird. I think it is, and uh, we've been 312 miles an hour in it, and it's nitrous. It has three stages of nitrous, and we run almost 50 pounds of nitrous in a pass. So that kind of gives you an idea of what you can do with nitrous sometimes. Uh, we have probably the second fastest nitrous car that's that's been out there. There is a streamliner. Uh, oh, I can't think of his name. It was the Spirit of Rhett, R-E-T-T, -T, I believe. And uh, they, they done a uh, rare Morrison uh, engine in a streamliner, and they went you know, uh, 400 to 400 miles an hour, maybe high 300s wow. uh, on a couple of stages wow. of nitrous, but they just really just put it in the last mile and didn't run it that long. This Firebird to try to get it, the thing is like a brick going down the, the track. Uh, so we have to run it. It runs about 50 seconds. The the nitrous is on for about 50 seconds and we have four 15 pound wow. bottles in the back of it. And we empty basically all four of them. That's crazy. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it took us a while and to, to figure out how to make it live that long. Uh, so to give you an idea, I started helping those guys in 97, and I think it was 2013 when we finally got over 300 in it. So it kind of gives you an idea how long it took us to do it. We, we wow. broke a lot of parts. There wasn't a lot of nitrous breakage, but there was a lot of parts being broke just trying to get that car. Uh, the car weighs 7,000 pounds. Holy night. So, so it has to be a stock body. <laughs> the, the whole thing was just to be a production type body. So you couldn't put big wings or anything like that on for downforce. So to, for out there for downforce, you either do a aerodynamic downforce or you do weight. And so with that being in that class, it had to be weight. So it's about a 7,000 pound car. 
I've, I've seen and heard a lot of guys out there that just a bunch of shot lead just keep it and it's crazy how how uh, nuts the weights can get for cars out there because it's like dude, you got to keep it down you get like you and if you flip if anything happens a wreck like bird shot and lead and all oh, it's kinds a disaster because just, just think of the the inertia that's that's moving at that speed and it just destroys everything yep, i mean you know yep. that kind of weight uh moving yeah it's not a happy thing after that and we do oh. some of the i do some lakester stuff that we've been doing over 326 mile an hour on, on it and it doesn't weigh much but we have the ability to put arrow on it to get it down the track. So it's just different ways sure. of doing it. Uh, yeah. So that that's, I, I've done a bunch of different ones, you know, land speed and obviously the drag race stuff and all that. And nitrous has a good place. I just feel that it's, it's, it's not on its way out because it, it still has a, a place. I think in some of the sportsman type racing, like top sportsman, I think does real well with it. It, it, it's still competitive for yeah. sure. Like in certain in certain areas, it is still competitive. Yeah, I just think the pro mod world. I think I, I just don't know how much longer it can be competitive unless they really just keep the rules bending the rules around just purely to keep somebody out there as another power option. Uh, because yeah. you know, I, when when pro mod, I guess it was pro street back then. Whenever they decided they would do turbos, uh, I was sitting in Pat Musi's dino cell and we were sitting there talking about it and, and i told him i said look i said when they allow this at that time they had no boost limits i said you guys don't have a chance i said there's no way i said you will not be competitive unless they start pushing the rules around to make you competitive and we kind of see where that went uh, yeah and they've they've kind of done that and like it's another one of those things where like i unfortunately agree that their needs like the the nitrous uh the nitrous technology in general in the industry it could really use a revamp otherwise the big big guys uh you know a thousand whatever cubic inches on these m multiple kits that are just hitting with an insane amount of spray and displacing literally all the <laughs> air mm -hmm. in the motor it's just that you're just hit you're hitting a wall and it's it's crazy i mean if you'd have told me because like sunnies came out with that hundred that thousand six cubic inch motor a while ago but like no one i never really saw it right and it's supposed to make a bunch of power and a and now the industry has evolved to that where it's like yeah a thousand cubic inches is pretty standard and back when that one was you know unveiled it wasn't standard and now it's like oh yeah like 959 is like the like where you start yeah i, I would have crazy bet, i would have bet money that that thousand cubic inch couldn't make it down the quarter mile in one piece right yeah oh no it won't yeah. like yeah you wouldn't think and, it would live and and i mean you see them yeah now some you know like you said technology it comes back to technology and everything is just advancing and hopefully fingers crossed the the nitrous uh the nitrous technology can can follow suit yeah I'd, I'd like to see it and and i think there's some you know it still has a place out there the, the unfortunate part is that with the the nature of nitrous because it's cryogenic it has cryogenic properties to the flow and all that it makes it really really hard to do anything with the pressures the cryogenics and all that just makes it really difficult so somebody's really going to have to pony up and put some some serious money into some development uh because i've tried uh I, I bet i've tested 30 different solenoids and some of them had promise but as soon as you start putting a lot of nitrous through them the the nitrous liquid would just freeze them up and they wouldn't control anymore they, they couldn't won't. open and close and and it was all just a you know it ended up being a little bit of glimmer of, of hope turning into well this just can't work and so you go back to the the solenoid manufacturers and they're obviously like peter paul is one who supplies the majority of the ones that are out there and you talk to them and they're like, yeah, hey, we'd be happy to do a development project with you, but it's going to start, you know, and, and a number with several zeros behind it uh, before we're going to do it. And with the nature of nitrous right now, the streetcar stuff isn't what it used to be. You know, one time uh, when Holly bought NOS back in like 2003 or four, somewhere in there, and the Fast and the Furious broke loose, there could have been some potential for it there because, you know, it was going crazy. Uh, yeah, we, we have to give credit where credit's due for Fast and Furious, I agree. Yeah, yeah, for what little bit they did uh, to the world of, of motorsports, <laughs> I would uh, say yeah. that, that that was one of the positive <laughs> sides of it. And uh, and I worked, I've worked at a bunch of different places. Uh, one of the places I worked, we, we made a, a warning that would flash up on the screen, danger to manifold, just so we could flash that up <laughs> and blow the I floorboard out from under the car. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But it would be well, nice cool. for somebody. J to Jamie, I'll, I'll, I think we got to get on to our next show, but I really appreciate it. Like I said, again, I really appreciate you coming on. A lot of good stuff, a good time for sure, and a lot of uh, knowledge. 
and uh yeah we'll uh we'll get back with you yeah anytime sure you want to talk you. about nitrous i'm, I'm up for it so that was a real treat uh having jamie on as well as nitro dave i i liked uh when jamie talked about the like the cubic inches and basically the the hopeful need for uh, nitrous technology to, to advance and it's still 100 percent relevant they're still nitrous guys and hopefully there can be some more advancements to help them uh stay super competitive in the top classes like they are now and i that I mean, we might as well close out the show because I learned a lot. I mean, I'm like I said, I'm building a my nitrous fox body, and uh, about I loved how uh, Nitro Dave just said like timing, like at the end of his like this, you, you got to be careful with timing, and so that's something that I'm gonna take away from mine for sure. Uh, what about you, Wagner? Well, yeah, just in general about the timing, and of course, what Dave talked about nitrous distribution on how important it is to make sure it's not just how much you're stuffing into that engine, but you got to make sure you're stuffing it in all the right little cracks and crevices, because otherwise, you know, you're going to get too much fuel or too much juice to one hole or another, and then uh, all of a sudden you're knocking ventilation holes and pistons and having a real bad day. Yep, I couldn't agree more. So, uh, thanks to all of our viewers and listeners. Uh, this has been Tech Inspection. If uh, We really appreciate your feedback. If you guys have any questions or comments, make sure to hit us up below. And we will see you in the next episode.